Welcome to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason, and with me today is Rich. Hello, Rich. Hello. How's it going? Hanging in there, you know. Um, just uh, sort of di- digesting the last NBA season, the the 2020 season, which we've, of course, you know, mentioned in previous shows is one of the crazier seasons in NBA history with the... Um, you know the coronavirus influenced uh, uh, postponement of the season. Eventually, resumed it in the bubble and uh, the historic finals between the Los Angeles Lakers and the Miami Heat. The Heat, of course, being one of the um, you know great underdog teams in the NBA Finals. And you know we're going to kind of dig into you know how these finals made history. Yeah, I can't believe it's you know halloween like literally halloween right. when we're recording this and we're talking about the nba finals and it, it's it's relevant because the NBA finals just wrapped up like yeah, a week ago. ago or two weeks yeah. ago you know it's just right. like kind of like oh wow <laughs> that's it's just so yes. it's definitely an odd year definitely an odd year and especially right. like you know when when you know i log on to you know the, the finals are going on and then you know the finals end and then a week later i'm on twitter and it's like 28 years ago today this man made his debut and i'm like <laughs> wow like, yeah. Yeah. we're so turned around and so weird and uh, yeah. i don't know when we get back on track here uh but uh, the OCD in me is, is is not liking the idea that there was a season that was so strange and has the, the timeline is so weird and all that sort of stuff. But uh, at least we got to see some NBA finals. We got to see some basketball. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. We, we had a really cool finals, too. This is a really, really fun, uh, interesting finals and a historic finals as well as we're going to you know talk about here. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, obviously, um, it's going to be most remembered for LeBron James. Um, for the the things that he accomplished in the finals, obviously Jimmy Butler in a a finals loss, you know, put up a magnificent performance as well. Um, but really, yeah, it ended up kind of being, um, you know, the, the, I think the key narrative of will be LeBron. And, you know, most things that he's involved in it ends up being LeBron as well. But um, LeBron, you know, winning the finals MVP for the fourth time in his career, which is second to only Michael Jordan six in NBA history. Previously had been tied with Shaq and Tim Duncan and Magic Johnson as three-time winners. Also becoming the first player in NBA history to win the finals MVP with three different teams. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Kawhi Leonard had been the only other players to win it with two different teams. So Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, right that's, there, that's, some good, that's some good company right there. But, yeah, he immediately puts himself in a completely different uh, category there with those three different teams and 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 that's no I mean that's no small task either especially when you when you add in the years that have kind of passed uh, since he won his first Finals MVP and and, and now is you know his last one and you know Kareem Abdul Jabbar very similar kind of uh, length there of time Kawhi Leonard a little bit shorter but still yeah pretty remarkable uh, with three different teams I think which which speaks more to you, you know a lot to you know LeBron James and his greatness and also kind of the the change in in, in player movement and the change in, in sort of the style of, of of you know ways that guys you know move around and and, and you know bounce between teams or you know for in LeBron's case like really kind of control his path uh, towards you know what teams he's going to go to because there's probably other guys that if they had the choice would have probably played for more teams or if they you know really really you know wanted to could have played for more teams but uh, still a remarkable accomplishment nonetheless that that you know doing it with three different teams is is is, is no slouch that that's a big big deal yeah ab- absolutely um, yeah and, and it's of course you know LeBron is sort of has in, in many ways redefined what we expect the behavior of superstars to be. I mean, most superstars in the past, you know, have really just been part of one or two teams. Um, You know, a lot of times it's just just one team. Obviously, he left, um, teamed up with Dwayne Wade and um, Chris Bosh in Miami. And I think just completely changed the expectations of superstars. Now the stigma over changing teams um, you know, for for top superstars for for making that choice, not having that choice made for them in a trade. Um, I, I think the stigma for, for that is is definitely reduced. Um, a lot more players are willing to do it now, and even willing to do it after having been in a finals or you know having won a championship, like obviously Kawhi Leonard did. So um, I think that's a big change, and, and yeah, I think um, and, and then doing it for the Lakers too. Obviously, the Lakers are one of the you know the. The, the, I think the two franchises that um, have the greatest, you know, accomplishments in NBA history, you know, go, going back to the, the the founding of the league in 1950, uh, you know, the, the Lakers and the Celtics are are tied for the most championships. If you include the NBL championships, which you know you should, uh, Lakers actually would be number one over the um, right. the Celtics. So, um, 
but I, yeah, I think doing it for the Lakers obviously means a lot to that fan base and, and, and changes a little bit um, NBA history. I mean, obviously, you know, either way, whether he'd won this year or, or, or not, he's always going to be in the discussion of, you know, the top, the greatest players of all time, him, Jordan, and Kareem. I, I think you, you and I both agree that that's kind of the, the, the top three somewhere is, you know, you, you pick between those three guys. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Yeah, yeah. And he's, I, I think he's been there already. But now he's just he's just solidifying it. Now he's to, to me he's really kind of just going for that number one spot. And and I don't want yeah this is not the time for the discussion. Right. And I'm not really interested sure. in doing that. You know who is right. the greatest? Thing? Like that that's we've never yeah. done it on the show. And I'm not really interested in doing this show. It's cream by the way. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but right. uh, you know yeah like right now it's just kind of resume building. Just put I mean he's already. He's already in that spot. Like the idea that, like, because I always love those articles. It's like, oh, what does this mean for LeBron's legacy? And it's like, I mean, really, right now we're just building. Like, I don't know that there's anything he could do to, like, you know, maybe like, and people are like, oh, if he, you know, if they, if they blow this three-one lead, and like his legacy. And I'm like, I don't really know. Like, I don't know. Like, it's fucking LeBron James. He's been great for twenty years now. Like, what are we doing? Why are we like, oh, I don't know about his legacy now after this. Like, right. I really, I, I'm in the, I'm in the idea that now all he can do is really build and add to that legacy. I feel like there's nothing he can do to, to that, that's all of a sudden going to make it unless like some actual, like, you know, like he murders somebody and then it's like, well, all right, like, all right. All right. it makes it yeah. a little tougher to talk about uh, LeBron James since he, uh, you know, murdered his family or whatever. Like that would suck. Like that would definitely be, but like on the court, there's not really much he can do that, that I'm going to say like, oh no, like he really hurt, you know, like now it's just adding to that resume and can he get to that top spot? Can he become undisputed where it's, it's, it's even silly to even discuss any other names if it's silly to even discuss Jordan and Kareem. And I don't know that we'll ever get to that. But I think this year adds another wrinkle there where you're like, ah, damn, we're getting there. We're getting to the point where, sure. you know, now maybe it is time to, to, to start having that discussion or really start thinking about it. So, um, yeah, that's, 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 you know, th- this final is absolutely, you're right. There's a lot of stories, a lot of things going around. Uh, but when it's all said and done, it's about LeBron putting yet another, you know, resume together, adding some more things that, that, you know, really, really stand out, uh, as, as all time great, especially given the longevity of his career. Sure. And, you know, he's right. Obviously, he's near the top of the list, you know, with a bunch of other guys. But you know, he's near the top of the list in terms of um, most finals appearances now. You know, he's, he's up to 10. You know, can he could he pass Bill Russell at 12? You know, is that is that conceivable is, you know, it, it, he has a chance to you know break Kareem's record for most points all time. Um, yeah, I mean, he has a chance to accomplish a lot of things that I think, you know, we probably thought were impossible at the beginning of his career. Um, I mean, he's, he's just driving that stuff, just things that I, I think were kind of considered unbreakable records or things that just weren't realistic in this era of the NBA. You know, he's, he has a chance to do or come close to. So, yeah, I, it's really, I, mean, I guess it depends on how much longer he can still remain, you know, either the best or among the best players in NBA history area, you know, in the, at the top of the league at the time, you know, he's, he's definitely, he's been that for 15, 16 years. And, you know, I think another three or four years of that is probably realistic. So I guess it just kind of depends on long Jeffy Biddle. Of course, it'll be interesting to watch and interesting to talk more about as uh, the accomplishments come rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned the one thing there, which is pretty interesting that, you know, when he came into the league, we were like, Oh, I don't, you know, no one's going to be able to beat Kareem's, you know, record because look at how the scoring is. And he's played for so goddamn long that like the style of the, the game has changed radically from when he came uh, into the league. And that, right. that, that speaks again. Like he comes in the league when it's a little bit more isolation heavy. It's a little slower. He comes in during, you know, the, the heyday of kind of the Pistons and the slow it down Eastern Conference and hell the Spurs were slow at that time too. Everybody was slow. And then, you know, right. he plays through the, you know, the seven seconds or less era comes and, sure. and he's kind of, you know, there as, as, as slowly but surely people start getting invested in maybe playing a little bit faster, not necessarily the threes. And then we get, you know, obviously the, the three point revolution and now what it is today where it's just like, you know, three points, speed, all that sort of stuff. And that, that speaks to it again. Like, yeah, in 2003 and 2004, 2005, you're like, ah, yeah, you know, the best players are only scored, you know, 25 points a game or whatever. And now he's still in the league <laughs> and the league has changed to the point where the top stars are are, are scoring 30 points a game uh, relatively easily. And again, again, that just speaks to how wild it is, how long he's been in this league. And, 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 and yeah, we just passed up, I think, his uh, some another historic anniversary because, you know, his debut um you know, happened, you know, in 2003 and, and, and every single year it comes up again where it's like, you know, 17 years ago, you know, the, right. and, and you got to like look at the players that he played with and like all these other guys. And you're like, oh, my God, like like all these men have, have, have come and gone and, and he's still he's still here and he's still great. And it's not like he's just like hanging on and people are like, well, you know, it's not like he's tagging along for and, and really none of these guys. I mean, I really don't think 
I mean, Jordan, I guess the Wizards things, you could say whatever, but he was still kind of a productive-ish player. Kareem, maybe in the last year it was starting to get there, but Kareem was still a solid enough player. But, like, none of those guys, and, and we'll see. I don't know if it's ever going to come for LeBron. It seems like it might not ever. That, like, they just become, like, guys on a team where it's just like, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's still here. Like, we're, we're you know, he's still, you know, good. But he's not, like, he's still the best player on his team. And he's still, like, the, you know what I mean? He's still, like, the best player in the league or arguably one of the t- best players in the league. And I think that's even more ridiculous accomplishment that just, yeah, he's played this long. And pretty much from the moment he started until today, he's been, you know, in the conversation as one of the top players in the league, which is just absolutely crazy. Right. I mean, Scottie Pippen was still playing when LeBron debuted. Right. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's played a long time. And, um, I, you know, it's, it, it's pretty obviously you know, it, it's remarkable um, all the things that he's. Uh, done in his his career, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously he's had some high profile, um, you know, failures in terms of finals or things, or you know, he he's had uh, times in his career where things didn't quite go his way, but uh, and you know, the, the the record now being four and six in the finals, you know, st- still although that, that certainly you know improved from um, you know what it was previously, um, but it, it still not, doesn't quite match you know some of the other track records, obviously Jordan, but. Um, but still, yeah, you look at the whole body of work and it's it's getting harder and harder to, to find um, reasons to, you know, to drag him down. Yeah. Oh, I'll find some. <laughs> I don't All know right. where. It's going to be hard, but I'll find yeah, it. Yeah, you'll, you'll find it. All right. Yeah. Well, you and Skip Bayless will find yeah, it. There, he's, yeah, he's really struggling, but he's still finding them. So <laughs> you know, if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. All right. Well. Fair enough. Okay, so um, now he is one of 40 players who have four or more rings. Of course, you know, a lot of Celtics on there. Bill Russell, number one at 11. Sam Jones at two. Handful of guys at eight or uh, seven, including Robert Ory. Um, you know, is anybody on this? We don't need to go through everybody. Is anybody on this list uh, particularly surprising to you? Not really. I mean, most of the guy. We, 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 I think we've we've talked about this list before on the the show. I mean, it's just like a lot of sixty Celtics, which is fine. Like you know, every one of those guys, and every single one of those guys played like I think a, a semi important role. We've talked about that before. That like you know maybe like a Sash Sanders, you could be like, oh, I don't. But like he, you know, you go through and look, and like yeah, he was an important part of those teams uh, as well. And, and Russell, of course, Jones, of course, uh, both Jones is important parts. Hindson, obviously, a huge part. Havlicek, a huge part of the team. So yeah, I have no, um, you know, no real surprise with those guys. I would say not really. No, I think everybody, I mean, Robert Ory, again, everybody kind of knows the story with him and, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll talk about him a little bit later as, as, you know, he, you know, did, did play an important role in those teams. Maybe not as important as, as a lot of the guys that, that kind of preceded him in this list. But, uh, no, I don't, I'm not really surprised by any of those guys. Uh, when you get down to like the fives and the fours, there's a few guys that kind of pop up that you kind of go, eh, I don't know about those guys. But yeah, for the most yeah. part, it's a list of, uh, of, of guys that you pretty, are, are pretty synonymous with, you know, dynasties and, 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 and winning a lot of titles. So no one that totally, you know, stands out to me. Yeah. Probably Gene Guarilia is always one who's um, on the list. He technically has four rings, but only actually played in two of those players. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. He's... In Wikipedia, um, they differ on, on the listing there. But yes. Uh, but then, yeah. Hey, you know, see, uh, I, I'm sure Gene was an important part of those teams. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Even in the practices, slapping, right. by, slapping asses, yeah. you know, getting, yeah. getting people right. excited. You know, that's yeah. important. Good old, good old slapping ass Quarelia. Is what <laughs> right. yeah, right. So, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a different time. Um, yeah. So um, another thing, you know, we've already mentioned LeBron, you know, of course, winning finals MVP for three different teams means you win rings for three different teams. And, uh, he uh, joined an exclusive club along with Danny Green um, on this list. Um, you know, Danny obviously did it with the uh, the Spurs last year with the Raptors, this year with the Lakers. Robert Ory did it with the Rockets in the '90s, and then the Spurs and the uh, and the Lakers. And um, John Sally did it with the uh, Pistons, the Bulls, and the uh, Lakers as well. So that's a uh, uh, the Lakers keep um, appearing on that list. Yeah, that's going to be one constant here. Is that yeah, going going to the Lakers is an important part of getting rings later in your career. It seems, but uh, yeah, for Green, LeBron, Ori, and Sally, all of them, yeah, their last most recent year uh, with yeah. the Lakers. So I mean, uh, it's, actually, it's a good place to go. Yeah, actually, no, I've, uh, Ori was the Spurs were his last championship. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, for, I always forget. Yeah, I always forget. In <laughs> 05 and 07, Yes, right. so because he won the three in a row with the Lakers, and then he went to the. Um, 
he he went to the the Spurs in 04 and uh then yeah won the 05 and 07 championships. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah, he was, he was, yeah. I forget if he was a Spurs as long as he was too. Like he kind of for me yeah. he's like five years, yeah. Yeah, he's like really synonymous with like the Lakers more than almost any other team, but like yeah, his Rockets run is pretty long and his Spurs run is, yeah. is really really long uh, I, as well. So yeah, sorry, sorry for mixing that up. Yeah, cuz we're going to talk about him a little bit later, but yeah, that's Right. I I personally really think of him as a Phoenix Sun. Yes. <laughs> more yeah. synonymous with the Phoenix Sun. Yes, absolutely. You know, throwing a towel on Danny yes. Ashton. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. We'll talk about that later. All right. All right. Uh, and then, you know, we have, um, you know, we've we've added to the list of players with back to back rings on different teams Be- before uh, last season, the 2019 finals. There are only three guys on this list. Of course, you know, the legendary Pepsol with the um, 51 Rochester Royals. We don't have to, how many times are we going to talk about Pepsol on the show? Like, we're good. <laughs> you know, everybody knows. You don't have to even explain everybody it anymore. Knows about yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, who needs Air Jordan when you've got Pepsol? Yeah, you know, right. Where's the Pepsol's last dance? You know what I mean? Like, where was that right. documentary yeah. during, you know? Right. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know, honestly. I mean, yeah, exactly. We're, when we really need more Pepsol in our lives. Um yeah, four NBA titles in six season, won four in a row. The fifty one with Rochester and the fifty two through fifty four with the uh, Lakers. So yeah, really uh, great accomplishment there. Then we've got Jackie Moore, nineteen fifty five Syracuse Nationals, nineteen fifty six Philadelphia Warriors. Uh, beat the uh, Fort Wayne Pistons both times. So Jackie Moore really hated the Fort Wayne Pistons. <laughs> right. Really hated yeah. Frank Zolner, which you know I, I agree. I, yeah, well, I mean, understandably. You know, <laughs> I think very, I don't know. I'm sure I don't know if he's going to do it. I'm, I'm probably yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Jackie Moore. Yeah, he won. He averaged uh, two point seven points per game um, in his uh, in his career, um, and uh, so so that was good. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then he um, and then Steve Kerr with the the ninety eight Bulls and the ninety nine Spurs. They, um, uh, they of course you know again like like Pep saw Steve Kerr won four championships in a row when, with uh, two different teams. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, what's what's real super interesting about this is so we have Pep saw. 1951-52, Jackie Moore, 1955-56. Then we go all the way to Steve Kerr, 1998-1999. And now three times in the last three years, guys have won time <laughs> rings on back-to-back teams. Uh, it's a it's a who's who. You know, we talked about you know the, the, the stars of the NBA, Pep Sol, Jackie Moore, and Steve Kerr. Well, get ready because these stars are even on bigger levels. Pat McCaw, 2018 Golden State Warriors, 2019 Toronto Raptors. Chris Boucher, isn't it Boucher or right? I, I think that's how you pronounce it. I think so. Yes, yes. I, the fact that I don't know is <laughs> probably speaks right. to his, his contributions. But he also was on the 2018 Warriors and the 2019 Raptors, uh, and now probably the best guy of, of the recent vintage here, uh, Danny Green, 2019 Raptors, now 2020. Uh, Los Angeles Lakers. So yeah, three times in 50 years of the NBA, basically, and now three times in the last three years, two guys with the same teams in the same combination, uh, which is pretty uh, hilarious as well. And then yeah, obviously uh, Danny Green doing it um, with those guys as well, but then moving on to the Lakers uh, this year. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a good streak there. I could see it see it happening this year again too. So yeah. so Rich, I'm afraid that we're going to have to issue a, a bit of a correction here. Um, so Jackie Moore. Did play one game for the 1955 Syracuse Nationals. However, um, he ended the season as a Philadelphia Warrior in in the 55 season. Uh-oh. So he did not get a ring with the 55 Nationals. Um, he uh, he only played. He actually. It's today is the um, what would be the uh, 76th anniversary of his uh, <laughs> of his uh, two points and two uh, personal fouls against the uh, Minneapolis Lakers in a three point loss. Um, yeah. Oh, I always I always celebrate this so. day by by handing out uh, candy to children. That's that's what I usually do on this day. So. Yes. Um, they, they're always weird. They're wearing like costumes and shit. And I'm like, you guys don't really have to. It's Jackie Moore right. anniversary day. Like, you know, yeah. Just come and ask for candy. Like, I don't know why you have to wear like a, you have to be a ghost or whatever. But here's uh, candy anyway. It's uh, it's very strange. Yeah. yeah. But but don't. Yeah. The, my whole neighborhood gets involved and, and gets excited about it too. So that's cool. Right. So. Honestly, everyone should just dress up as Jackie Moore. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That's honestly what they should. Yes, he played one game for the Nationals. Uh, one see, game this is, this for is the, the Syracuse that, Hawks. Yeah. When you when you do this and and, and we we bumped into this a lot during the show is that like different places count like 
if you ever played on that team at any point for like a game or two games or 10 minutes or two right. minutes, they consider you a member of that championship team. And that's, you know, sure. that's tough. Cause like, I, I, I'm, you know, I don't know, but I'm, I'm guessing that the 1955 Syracuse Nationals did not send Jackie Moore a uh, championship ring right. uh, for well, his one game contribution. Yeah. So. I mean, they, they famously didn't even have rings for like right. 60 years. Yeah. <laughs> exactly they, they right. I think they gave them rings like, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So, um, yeah. So there were no rings then. So, yeah. So, um, uh, apologies to Jackie Moore, but you'll always have your own day. So yeah, <laughs> you'll always have October thirty first every single right. year. So. Jackie Moore day, you know, as, as we know. So um, yeah, good times. So only five times technically in uh, NBA history. Yeah, get out of here! All right, get out of here, Jackie Moore. Yeah, so. You're out of here. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Jackie. Yeah, it makes Chris Boucher's uh, accomplishment that much more important. So. It really does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when is Chris Boucher day? That's the question that <laughs> right, I think we we'll have right. to ask now. We'll we'll figure that out later. We don't we don't want to derail the show. So. Um, and, uh, so of course, you know, Andre Iguodala lost in the finals 2019 with the Warriors and then lost in the finals 2020 with the Heat. So that made me think, okay, well, who are guys who lost back to back finals with different teams? You would think that this was a, a, a fairly rare occasion, but it happened perhaps more than, certainly more than I expected. So, um, We've got Anderson Verjao, 2015 Cavs, 2016 Warriors. I almost had kind of forgotten about that one, but that, of course, was you know pretty famous at the time. Verjao had been with the Cavs for like 10 years, and um, you know I think he was, he was cut by the team in 2016 and then ended up signing with the Warriors, and everyone thought like, oh, you know, Anderson Verjao, it might be the Cavs whisperer, but it didn't really turn out that way. No, <laughs> certainly uh, maybe the opposite, yeah, it, it right. definitely. But uh, thankfully, he was able to get his ring in, in, in 2017, though, so he yeah. was able to right the wrong, because that kind of stinks when you're like, ah, oh, man, well, I'm going to go with the team that just beat us in the finals and then the team that you left right. beat your new team in the finals. That's right. really humbling. So that was good that, you know, yes. I well, one of, was able to get right. it going. So one of only three instances on this list where, you know, he would, um, lo- where you know, he'd play for the losing team and then go to the winning team and the winning team would lose the next. Right. Team. So, right. <laughs> um, we have LeBron James and James Jones, both on the 2014 Heat and the 2015 Cavs. I double checked, and James Jones did play in the finals in 2014. Um, Todd McCullough, 2001 Sixers and 2002 Nets. Yeah, oh, that boy had a that poor man had yeah. Shaquille O'Neal's testicles in his face a lot. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and say that I'm going to probably guess that no one was more upset about the results of the 2002 Western Conference Finals Game 7 famously Kings and Lakers than Todd McCullough because I'm pretty sure he really did not want to play Shaq in the finals again. Yeah, he's thinking like, Vladdy, oh, okay, that'll be, you know, I just have to guard him at the high post, you know, Scott Pollard, he's a little tricky, but I can figure him out, and then it's like nope, it's Shaquille O'Neal again, and he's just like, ah, oh, God. <laughs> like, you go back to the 2001 Finals too, and Shaq just ate him a lot. Live, but uh, luckily, Tony uh, 20, didn't the twenty two uh, or the twenty oh oh two Nets. They had uh, they had Aaron Williams to back up Todd McCulloch too. So oh yeah, absolutely. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't just Todd McCulloch eating you know nut sandwiches from Shaq, but uh, right. I'm sure he ate plenty of them as well because I think Shaq again won Finals MVP and just completely dominated the Nets. So I, I forgot that. McCullough, he only spent one year with the Nets and then was traded back to the Sixers for Dikembe Mutombo, who yes, of course right, was right, also right. on the L1, you know, Sixers. So, um, yeah, I, the Nets kept trading for guys who were, uh, you know, dominated by Shaq in the finals. So, I, uh, <laughs> right. I mean, exactly. that was pretty much everybody. You know, it again, was hard very, not to find a big man who, who hadn't right. been destroyed by Shaquille O'Neal. So, yeah, I yeah. think they, they desperately tried to find somebody, anybody, but, uh, uh, yeah. they, they never did, unfortunately. Hey, at least he played him, you know, in the finals. So, hey, what, what can you say? So, uh, next, of course, our uh, our favorite player, Danny Ainge, with the '92 Blazers and the '93 Suns. Um, Steve Mix, uh, all mixed up with uh, the uh, 1982 Sixers and the 1983 Lakers. Another instance of you know, I played with this team for so <laughs> yeah. long, and I got dominated by the Lakers, and then you know, he was kind of out when the uh, you know when the um, Sixers got Moses Malone. He was, you know, getting toward the end of his career by then. Spent most of the season with the Bucks, and then uh, was cut by the Bucks. Spent played one regular season game in '83 with the Lakers before, you know, being on the playoff roster. And then, yeah, then they get swept by the uh, Sixers in the playoffs. So, um, and we got Earl Monroe, seventy-one bullets and seventy-two Knicks. I kind of obviously this is a pretty famous instance of. Um, you know, going, you know, for a, a very pretty famous trade of like Monroe, a superstar at the time, wanting out of Baltimore, going to the Knicks, you know, the, the how is the um, 
the uh, backcourt of Monroe and Frazier going to work, but I kind of forgot, you know, that, oh yeah, the 72 Knicks, of course, you know, went to the finals, played the Lakers and um, lost to the, you know, the, the, what at the time, the best regular season team of all yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of, for whatever reason, I was kind of forget about the, the 72 Knicks. And, and I think it's because the other Knicks of that, you know, decade are, are, you know, so famous and so important and, right. and, and whatnot. And, and then the 72 Lakers are so famous and so important that, yeah, you kind of right. forget that. Oh yeah. The Knicks were like there and yeah, they made it to the finals. Yeah. yeah. It was the, it was, it was kind of inevitable that year almost. You know, right, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was like a five game series. And, and then of course the Knicks would win the championship the next year in 73 against the Lakers. So, and then we've got, uh, the legendary Tr- John Travant with the 1970 Lakers. And the 1971 bullets. So um, I am going to be honest and say I had not heard of uh, John Travant before, but he played in the uh, NBA for quite you know decent amount of time from 65 to 73. Played for the then St. Louis Hawks. Then with the Pistons, a little bit with the Royals, a little bit with the Sonics, uh, and then a little bit with the Lakers, and and then ending his career um, with three seasons with the Baltimore Bullets, where he had uh, he, uh, he he had his most success, I guess you could um, say, but was you know a, a, a pretty key role player on that seventy one uh, Finals team. Kind of did a little bit of. Um, of everything, but uh, but yeah, sort of a uh, like I said, a guy, a guy I had uh, was totally not familiar with at all. He uh, played; uh, he didn't even actually play um, high school basketball. He was cut from the team. He played <laughs> high school football and baseball. Went to the Air Force, um, and then he I guess he grew a lot when he was um, playing AAU ball. Then he went to Seattle University and and played well there. And then um, in fact, he he scored. He got 40 rebounds in a game against the University of Montana um, and was drafted. You know, just had a solid NBA career as a uh, as a role player. Um, yeah, so a few good years in here. Yeah, that, yeah. Like a guy that, yeah, I never really ever given any thought to, and I don't even know if I've seen the name, but yeah, a few double-digit scoring years. It's some pretty decent run, and yeah, a, lot, a pretty long career for, you know, a guy who <laughs> didn't seem to, right. you know, like you said, it wasn't even really thinking about basketball at any point in his career or any point in his life. Right. And yeah, he ends up carving out almost a 10-year career. So Yeah, he... Um, he uh, apparently he invented something called the total rebounder exercise system, which is a basket designed and used for training young players and, and rebounding techniques. So there you go. I'm, gonna, nice. I'm assuming Wikipedia is correct about this. Unfortunately, there's no citation for oh, me. Too. And I'm going to be say I'm going to say I'm too lazy to um, to. I'm not. What was it called again? The total rebounding uh, <laughs> so, total rebounder exercise system. So yeah, you uh, total you dig into that exercise system. I want to get this. Thing. Yeah, well, we don't, we'll correct the record if we were incorrect about that. But well, I'll move on to Jim King in the meantime. The '66 Lakers and the uh, '67 Warriors. Actually, Jim King, another guy I, I don't really ever recall hearing about, although he some great nicknames here we got we got country jim king jimmy which he obviously that's one and then mr hustle mr. also hustle, um, yeah. mr hustle yeah so that's a great i'm assuming not because of the dance because we're a little bit early for the, uh, <laughs> I, i'm you know the dance uh not known for that because of that but he was an all-star the next season in 1968 with the warriors um averaging a 16 point uh, six points and uh uh 4.5 rebounds, 4.2 assists. He played um, played guard. His career, I guess, you know, you get uh, you get old Rick Barry out of the way. You know, it's like, all right, yeah, it's Jimmy King time. It's time for Mr. Hustle. Mr. Hustle, really yeah. <laughs> it's time for it. Country Jim to do yeah. some work here. So. Exactly. Yeah. Country Jimmy's going to be, you know, kicking some butt. Yeah, he did for uh, for one season. Uh, but, yeah, he um, spent uh, – started his career with the Lakers – uh, went on to the Warriors for three seasons. Then uh, I, I think he was involved in the trade for uh, Jerry Lucas from the Warriors to the um, uh, no, actually a different trade. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, he was involved with the uh, trade along with Bill Turner to the Royals for Jerry Lucas, and then uh, ended up uh, he had a few years as a uh, hustling role player with the uh, Chicago Bulls. Also, the early seventies, of course, so one of our favorite teams. But let's talk about. Yeah, that, so. yeah absolutely. Uh, I can't find um, anything about uh, the total rebounder exercise system. So. All right, unfortunately, well, we'll have to. We'll assume that one's correct. If we ever get, if we ever comes up again, we have to correct the record, people. But yes, no, also, I'm, I'm pretty sure. You know, in looking, I look it up, and it, it comes up with his name. And there's like a Seattle.com article about it or whatever, but yeah. I can't seem to find all. Fi- all okay. I find is like trampolines, like little mini trampolines, and I don't I think that's it. So um, probably not. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Darn. Uh, then uh, Larry Faust, the uh, 1959 Lakers and uh, 1960 Hawks. You know Larry Faust, one of the more unlucky players on the uh, in terms of uh, 
finals experience, lost twice with the uh, with the Fort Wayne Pistons, and then lost back to back with the Lakers and the Hawks. Lost lose a couple more times, I believe, to the Celtics with the uh, Hawks. Unfortunately, I think he was like zero and five or zero and six in the uh, in the finals in his career. And then uh, and then Chick Halbert, of course, with the. Uh, the 1947 Chicago Stags and the 1948 Warriors. Uh, the third instance here of being on the losing team the first time uh, in 47, the Stags lost to the Warriors in the finals and then going to the uh, the next year, going to the Warriors and the Warriors lost to the in the B.A. finals to the Baltimore Bullets. So bad luck for Chick. But, hey, you know, he was, uh, you know, oh, oh his, his full name, I'm sorry, was Charles. Pinkney Halbert the Fourth. I would have went by that. So it's such a distinguished name, but uh, I guess Chick's okay too. Yeah, Charles I mean, Pinkney Halbert the Fourth is pretty solid. <laughs> yeah, he was all BAA in his uh, in his first season. Yeah, so no, he was a good yeah. player. Yeah, looking at these stats here, it's, it's just you know yeah. an odd career because like, and it, it's kind of the the normal career of these guys where they play for like four years, they're like maybe good, and then they just kind of go away you know, really yeah. quickly. They're like, ah, I'm turning thirty. That's it for me. My peak is right. done. Like my career is over. So yeah, we go you know work for the electric company or something. So he just sure. you know, bounced. I don't know. I don't know exactly. Yeah, he started. Happens, I mean, he started age twenty-seven, so um, he's older at that point. Yeah, and guys aren't lasting much, much past you know their early thirties in those days. And, you know, and pro basketball is a very fly-by-night uh, type situation. But yeah, he was um, he was a center, six-nine. You know, he, he played for a lot of teams in the um, league. You know, as we mentioned, all second team honors there. Not really a, a whole lot of um, bio on. Uh, on anything that he did um, uh, after work, really. But um, let's see, he passed away in 2013 at age 94. I'm looking at his obituary right now, actually. Yeah, so, sure. uh, he shares a fantastic birthday. I can tell you that February 27th, one of the oh, all time nice. great days of uh, of all time. So, sure. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, we should just we should definitely just call that the um, <laughs> the Rich Great and Chick Halbert uh, day. That's right fine. There. Yeah. Yeah, Put your heart I out, mean, Chelsea Clinton, I, or whoever. I forget yeah, I definitely uh, should do that. Yeah. Oh, and he worked. Um, he played for the Philip sixty six um, AAU team. You know, um, as well. You oh, know, that's as, awesome. Of course, yeah. the yeah. I mean, that was one of the the more famous um, AAU teams as well. So uh, apparently, was was pals with the uh, some of the Harlem Globetrotters and played against them as well during his career. So. That was mentioned. And then, yes, yeah, settled into the uh, Tri-Cities later in his life. Or not, not with the Blackhawks had moved on by then, but um, I found that interesting. Okay, no, this is well, this, this is Washington. So is there a Tri-Cities in Washington that's not the same Tri-Cities? That's, uh, mm, I'm not sure, to be honest, yeah. Okay, I don't want to convey. We've already conveyed bad information. <laughs> that's what we so, do. I do like, yes. he did. The, the best part about him, though, is that he went to West Texas uh, A&M, which... Oh. Uh, oh, in another yeah. life, you know, you know West Texas A&M and any wrestling I, fan I know, do. Yeah. Uh, know West Texas A&M. That is the school of the wrestlers. Tolly Blanchard, Dusty Rhodes, Terry Funk, Ted DiBiase, Tito Santana. Uh, was it Bobby Duncan, Barry Windham, uh, right. Dory Funk, Stan Hansen, Brody, I think Bruiser Brody was from there too. And there's like a bunch of others. I mean, that was like wrestler you for a lot, like, and badasses too. That means that Chick Albert was a fucking badass. I'm positive right. of it. So, so I throw a lariat like nobody's business. I can wait, promise so that, you. So, so, okay, so, so West Texas University is different than Texas Western, which is now UTEP, right? Uh, yes, correct. Okay, all right. So that's not the team, you know, the the all African American team. That no, yeah, yeah. West Texas A and M, I think, is still West Texas A and M now. Uh, okay, to the state West Texas University, but now it's West Texas. Exactly A&M. right, 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 right. There's another NBA player that we talked about in a prior show that also had a West Texas. Um, uh, linkage but i'm i'm blanking on who it is and i feel like we should move on um but yes chick albert everyone so um yeah i'm just i'm gonna say his full name one more time because i enjoy it so much <laughs> charles pinkney halbert the fourth so yeah i um mo cheeks yeah. i think is the guy you're thinking of mo cheeks went to mo cheeks. Yeah. nice all right very another good another yes. great lariat too that dude could throw a lariat like no one's business as well, <laughs> yes so. yeah mo cheeks, you you all have badasses lives. my god right. so many badasses come from this school <laughs> it's it's incredible yeah yeah you really have not lived until you see mo cheeks throw a lariat so right. yeah so okay um Another accomplishment here, the lo- the longest uh, gaps between rings, the longest amount of time between winning championships. Uh, Rajon Rondo, you know, his last championship, of course, and, and they will never let you forget about it, is the uh, the 2008 Celtics. Oh, he was, and, I didn't know he was, he was on that team? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know. They yeah. won a ring? 
28 to 2008. 2008. Boston yeah, Celtics. Oh, okay. You right. don't hear much about it, but <laughs> yeah, really they, they yeah. won a championship that, that year in 2008. Yeah, Rajon Rondo was on that team. You know, there there were a few other guys there. Um, you know, Paul Pierce, um, I think was on that team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, if um, you say so, yeah, whatever. <laughs> coming on, this big man who says, you know, weird random things on Twitter. You know, he was on the team as well. Um, yeah. So anyway. On that team, wins it in 2020. Uh, that's that's 12 years, but that's not actually the longest uh, gap between rings. I uh, it took a long time to uh, decipher this. A lot, a lot of research. This was not an easy one, but yes, the longest gap between rings uh, actually also connected with that 2008 Celtics team was Sam Cassell won a championship with the '95 Houston Rockets, and then uh, and then won it again in. Um, 2008 with the Celtics, so 13 seasons. Um, AC Green and Rondo also 12 seasons. Uh, AC Green winning it with the 88 Lakers and then winning it again with the 2000 Lakers. Completely forget, like, there's so many random guys on those 2000 Lakers teams, you know, like AC Green and John Sally and, um, you know, just guys you kind of completely forget about, um, being involved. Yeah, that first there. year, especially. There's like a lot, because there's right. a lot of holdovers from like that previous Lakers regime. Like, to me, I always remember like the 01, the 02, the 03. Like, I remember those Lakers more than I remember those 2000 Lakers but yeah the 2000 Lakers are just filled with like a bunch of dudes like at the end of the bench that you're like oh yeah like uh, John Sale AC Green like you know even Glenn Rice yeah. sometimes I'm like oh yeah Glenn Rice is on the oh, team yeah. that's cool yeah. Like, you know. yeah, Glenn Rice is actually a fairly important part of those teams and you just kind of forget that because he fell off so quickly we talked about him a little bit be- before but um yeah, yeah the, 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 there are just some kind of random kids. And I guess the uh, the 90s Bulls um, a little bit as well, with, with the late 90s Bulls, which we'll talk about here, with uh, the only other instance I could find of more than 10 seasons was Robert Parrish, who won a ring with the the 86 um, Celtics, and then uh, in his final season with the 97 Bulls. You know, um, again, another kind of random name um, that was on those um, – 90s Bulls, but yeah, it, it's weird because you think of Robert Parrish already being, you know, relatively old in uh, 86. You know, he would he'd been in the league about, about 10 years at that point, but still ends up getting a ring 11 years later with the uh, 97. Yeah, yeah that's Bulls. awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> and he wouldn't take Michael Jordan shit. So that's uh, <laughs> which is another important. Yeah. yeah. Did they inter- did, was Parrish at all in uh, last? Was he interviewed at all in the last? Dance? I don't remember seeing him once. Yeah, okay. I don't remember seeing him yeah. even even uh, once. Yeah, they. they <laughs> They wouldn't. World's uh, not ready for what uh, our parents has to say. <laughs> what the chief has to say about it. Yeah, no, no, it's not, uh, not good. All right. Um, so one other aspect of history um, is that Talon Horton Tucker has now become the first player born in the 2000s to win an NBA championship. Can you tell us a little bit more about Talon Horton Tucker? Yeah, well, I can tell you one thing is it makes me incredibly old because I watched him many times, and I'm going to reference this later as, as well. I'm going to watch. I watched him many times in the uh, Illinois State Basketball Championships. He played uh, for yes. Simeon and, and, and won a ton of. That's the same place as Derrick Rose went and Jabari Parker went, uh, and they're a powerhouse in, in Illinois basketball. And I've seen, I've seen him play probably since he was like 15. <laughs> now I feel very, very old because All I right. was. Very old. I was much older when I was watching him play, and now he's got an NBA championship, and I'm just like, oh, dear God, I'm so old. Uh, but that's all right. Uh, he is the youngest American-born player to ever win an NBA Finals ring, which is like, pretty interesting as well. I don't think people really uh, bring that up uh, that often, but uh, he passes Lakers great. Uh, Magic Johnson, of course. Magic Johnson won his first championship uh, at age 20. Uh, in 1980, uh, some other guys that, that that are on this list as well, not American born um, per se. Uh, Darko Milicic, he won it when he was 18.9 years old. We need the point nine in there just to, to you know once we get kind of close there. Yeah, Darko. People always forget Darko. Yeah, he was on the team. <laughs> that was the, remember when the Pistons were like, wow, they won a title and they still have the you know the Darko sitting there on the bench ready to go. Like this is going to be incredible, and it it uh, it wasn't as much. Uh, Taylor Horton Tucker again, 19.8 years old. Uh, Magic Johnson, 20.7. So, again, Taylor Horton beats uh, Magic Johnson there. Uh, Tony Parker, obviously French-born, 21.1 years old when he wins his title. And then Vern Mickelson, who, who not technically born in America, but obviously, you know, it, it played an important role uh, on the Minneapolis Lakers, 21.5 uh, years old. I think I always forget that he was that young. Because, again, that was, like, right. rare to be that young and be that good in the NBA, d- d- you know, during that time period for sure. Sure, and that was kind of in the in the time in which before they were really enforcing the you know the the four years in right. college you know age limit type stuff. You know, he kind of got in right before they cracked down on that. But yes, um, so Taylor, I guess important to note that Taylor Horton Tucker did not play in the actual finals. He was on the team, of course. Um, 
but he he played two games in the playoffs against the Rockets. So um, he, of course, you know, he earned the ring. He was part of the roster. Um, no technicalities there, but he did not actually play right. in the finals. Where Darko Meltic actually did play in. Did the, he really? Uh, oh, I, I never. I, I thought he never got off the bench. I, okay, he, so he did. He did. Um, he played some garbage time. I'm, uh, we'll double check that because I don't want to pass any more bad bad information. But I am. Um, 99% sure that he did actually play um, very little amount of um, crunch time. Yeah, he played in three games in the finals uh, total. So uh, one was um, one minute, 48 seconds in one game. Um, in um, he played a, uh, nine seconds in another game. And then he played <laughs> a, a full 159 in the third game, which he was minus eight during that uh, 159. Ooh, so, well, yeah. That's why Larry didn't like him. <laughs> I gave oh, yeah. you time. We, yeah, I, I gave you. I gave you nine seconds, and you did nothing. Right. Exactly. Yes. So he he did uh, technically there. So yes. So um, however, yeah, he definitely does earn his ring. So that this uh, made us look into the other players that were first in their uh, decades to win a uh, NBA championship. So. Um, First, we would go to the 1930s. So there's a lot of guys who would be the first in the 1920s, um, so we're not going to do that. But uh, the first in the 1930s was Jim Holstein of the 1953 Lakers, who was born September 24th, uh, 1930. Anything that you can tell us about Jim Holstein? Uh, not really. Yeah, I was trying to. <laughs> I was really trying to find some stuff about him. I uh, don't have a lot. Uh, he was a two-time champion, of course, of the Minneapolis Lakers, as, as you said. Otherwise, a pretty mundane career. At Average, you know, under four points per game, under three rebounds per game. Uh, played only 15 minutes per game uh, average during his four-year career. I uh, ended out with the Fort Wayne Pistons, and I really tried to find more about Jim Holstein, and I failed. So, um, yeah. if you uh, are listening and you know more about Jim Holstein, please let us know because, yeah, we didn't, uh, we don't have too much there. I, I will say, yeah, he passed away in 2007. Um, he uh, he went, to, he grew up in Ohio, Hamilton, which is near Cincinnati. Um, went to went to college at the University of uh, of Cincinnati, and he was a coach at, uh, at Ball State as well in uh, in college. So yes, um, not a uh, not immense amount of information about uh, Jim Holstein, but you know gets to. But yeah, he was part of those um, Lakers teams, um, and um, and yeah, that's uh, that's all we have to say about that. Uh, the a player of uh, greater renown, the first. Uh, uh, to earn a ring having been born in the 1940s. John Havlicek of the 1963 Celtics, who was born um, in, on April 4th, 1940. Obviously, we have we did a whole show on his uh, career um, and life uh, when he passed away a couple years ago, which um, will um, – Make sure I may, may not be available in the archives right now. But we'll make sure and get that one um, posted so people can, can uh, hear about it soon uh, if you haven't heard it. But yes, um, obviously, Hall of Famer, 13 time All Star, eight time NBA championship, 11 times on the All NBA list, 74 finals MVP, you know, one of the true greats of his era. Um, and um, so we don't need to get into to a lot more details. I will note, however, another Ohioan on this list. Look at so, that. There's, Ohio, a, there's something in the water. <laughs> yeah. I mean, definitely better uh, representation for Ohio on this list than the Ohio president, um, I would have to say. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah. It's not a, not a sterling list. But so far, John Havlicek and Jim Holstein is, is, is a much better list uh, than the yes. Ohio president. So that's, that's good. That's, that's a positive. Yes. So uh, you want to talk about the uh, the first in the 1950s? Yeah. So we got two here. Uh, ABA, we're going to start out with George McGinnis was the first there. He did it uh, for the 72 Pacers. He was born August 12th, 1950. First off, I want to say absolutely great nicknames on basketball reference for George McGinnis. We have Big Mac, Baby Bull, McGinnis the Magnificent. Which I, is, yeah. I love That's that. Great. Idea. Yeah. Like, God, I'm, I'm just thinking of the marketing as, you know, him in like a weird, like a dollar store wizard outfit being like, come see McGinnis the Magnificent at the you know, at the Market Square Arena this week, uh, and then Big George, which is uh, is not as inspiring as McGinnis yeah. the Magnificent. So, but, but it's, but solid, it's not you know. bad. It's not bad. But yeah, when, when you have Magn- uh, McGinnis the Magnificent, it's it's, it's tough. There, maybe maybe Bull is pretty good too. But uh, again, we've probably talked about George McGinnis a lot. But uh, for those that don't know, he's a Hall of Famer, uh, six time All Star, two time ABA champion, two time All NBA. ABA all-time team as well, uh, three-time All-ABA, and the 1975 ABA MVP for him. Let me move yeah. over to the NBA. Uh, John, uh, well, was it uh, Gillinelli? Gianelli? I think it's Gianelli. Gianelli, we'll go Gianelli. There you go. Yeah. I'm not a 
Uh, not a good New Yorker, I don't know. But uh, so we went with the 1973 Knicks. He was born June 10th, 1950. Uh, Tom Riker uh, is another player that that has an option, you know, an ability to be here too. But he did not appear in the playoffs. So we're going to go with John uh, Gianelli then instead, because. Um, as far as him, relatively whole home career, I'd say. He joined a really good Knicks team like right out of the gates as, as he started his career, which certainly helps. Uh, did come into his own by 1975 or so. Knicks were regressing at that time, too, which is you know kind of like once he starts kind of being like, hey, I can score more, and hey, I'm getting more opportunities, uh, the team is starting to get bad. So he averages uh, 10.3 points per game, 9.3 uh, rebounds per game. Uh, his last two seasons, uh, or sorry, those are points per game, 10.3 points per game, 9.3 points per game. Uh, his last two full seasons with New York. So he's, he's decent. He's contributing a little bit uh and then i think probably more famously uh, he's traded from new york to buffalo for bob mcadoo and tom mcmillan obviously a, a huge deal for for new york moving for a star uh and bob mcadoo and then he pretty much bounced around for the remainder of his nba career um Again, involved in a pretty big trade for a pretty big guy in the East Coast. Uh, he is traded by the New Jersey Nets before even playing a game with them, along with Bernard King for Rich Kelly. So uh, Rich Kelly then a few months later is moved by the Nets. Uh, the, the Nets. Uh, Gianelli plays only 17 games for the Jazz, uh, and then he moves on. And then Bernard King would obviously make his presence very well known in uh, you know the New York, New Jersey region, but uh, certainly not as a member of the Nets, much more as a member uh, of the New York Knicks. But yeah, very famous, very cool story, too. And we've talked about Bernard King in, in the past as well. I think when we did a you know a, 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 about old Christmas games or whatever is that Bernard King like people forget that that dude bounced around a lot. He was really not able to find an NBA home for a long time uh, until he goes to New York and becomes yeah the, really the king of New York for a few years. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I would say about I mean, yeah, Gene Ellie, um Yeah, he played three years in Italy after his time with the uh, Jazz. Also, he you know, played the Bucks. Yeah, just yeah again kind of more of a, a solid role player than um, anything else. Uh, in, in terms of uh, Tom Riker, I, I would like to say that I do enjoy Tom Riker's uh, Wikipedia that uh, there's a note at the top that says, uh, for the Star Trek character, see Thomas Riker. So <laughs> right. I, I don't know if you uh, I don't know if you were ever uh, a Star Trek. I was not. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know so, 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 you know, the William Riker is, you know, he's the. Um, you know, the first commander, or I'm um, sorry, he's under, you know, Picard, of course, is in charge, and then he's second in charge is William Riker. But there's an episode where there were some sort of um, temporal disturbance or whatever in which there was a clone created of William Riker who was abandoned on the planet while the real William Riker, um, you know, went on and lived his life. And then many years later, they go back to this planet, and then William Riker finds, you know, um, the abandoned, you know, uh, other William Riker. Um, and then he eventually decides to call himself Thomas Riker instead of William Riker. Instead. Interesting. Well, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. So I think he turns evil uh, at some point. Oh, so no. anyway, yeah. So I have uh, forgotten there, but uh, yes. So, um, so yeah, fun times. Um, and then yes, first in the sixties. So we got to get, we got to get a little bit complicated here. Um, so, uh, the 83-76ers, at first I thought it was going to be Russ Shaney and J.J. Anderson but because the, they both played for the 83-76ers, but they were traded and released before the, uh, you know, during that season. Neither one played in the playoffs or on, uh, in the finals, obviously. So um, can't count them. But just as a footnote, um, Russ Shaney played the rest of the year with the Indiana Pacers. Then he'd miss uh, some some time. Uh, would play a little bit of in Italy, and then came back for probably his more famous three year run with the um, Seattle SuperSonics. I guess famous being a relative term, but, <laughs> right? Yeah, famous for him, but yeah, yeah, you know. Yes. So uh, his teammates uh, in Italy um, were uh, were Mike D'Antoni and uh, Joe Barry Carroll, and I believe he may have played for the uh, same uh, team that Rich Kelly uh, played for in uh, the, the the same Italian team, if I'm not um, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, oh, and and uh, John Gianelli played for that team too. Look so. at that! Look at that! A powerhouse! A power! They, they were like, hey, who <laughs> who won the most championships the first year? <laughs> you know, that they looked at this list and said, get them. We need them all. We need all these guys. That's right. We need all these guys. Yeah, that's a hell of a I, team, man. Mike D'Antoni. Right? I mean, that's that's some good talent there. Joe Barry Carroll and 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 Gianni, he, He's he wins MVP in 1986 Italian League MVP. I mean, that's a good. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. That's a good way to get a living there. Go to go to Italy. Be good. Yeah. Eat some. Pasta. I've been to Italy's greatest right. country. That's uh, right. I do that. Yeah. So yeah, did Joe Barry Carroll leave the NBA for a year to play for that team? I, I, I think I so because then he he he, he yeah. tacked on again a little bit later in his career with somebody else. Yeah, he must have just been a one year 
Yeah, he yeah he had four years with the Warriors, and then he he left in eighty five, and he was like averaging like twenty points per game, and then went back to the Warriors. Uh, he was gone for one year. I, I completely forgot about that. Interesting. So we'll have to dig into that a little bit more in a different episode. I feel like that's uh, that, that that needs some more exploration. So um, yes, yeah, so and then JJ Anderson ended up going to the. Um, Utah Jazz at the end of the 83 season. I think he was cut from the uh, Sixers. Eh, you know, had, had a solid little uh, NBA career. You've got a little footnote here about uh, Anderson. Yeah, so, uh, you know, J.J. Anderson, um, I know, I really know his name. And, 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 and like, when this came up, I was like, J.J., how do I know J.J. Anderson? Uh, his number 11, which is my favorite number, by the way, which is, is yeah, an, an irrelevant note to this, though. Uh, he's retired at Bradley University. Uh, in Peoria, and that is where, for the last you know twenty years or whatever, the Illinois high school basketball championships have been. So I have been looking at you know JJ Anderson's number on the walls of uh, you know the Carver Arena, I think is the name of it, uh, while watching Taylor Horton Tucker uh, you know win titles. So that's uh, that's where I see this. So yeah, no, he's, his number eleven is, is retired at Bradley University. So yeah, when I saw the name, I was like, I know that name, but how do I know JJ Anderson from the, you know the eighty three seventy sixers? And and that's how because yeah, he's, he's an important figure in in Bradley University history. So <laughs> yeah, so I. Until I read your your note there, I did not realize that eleven was your favorite number. But I separately, for reasons I, I don't recall why, was looking up to see uh, who was the most famous number eleven because yeah, I, I was just well, me. I couldn't <laughs> my, think uh, my my right. my player in NBA two K is, is incredible. What are you talking right. about? I mean, yeah. Besides him, you know who who is you know our our favorite number eleven? It, Jamal Crawford's number eleven, so that's obviously yeah, that's you know, that's maybe, yeah, that. you know one of the favorite ones. Yao Ming was eleven. Um, um, Sabonis was eleven. Um, Isaiah Thomas, who you know don't think uh, much of as a person, but as a basketball player, I do quite enjoy. You know, his number eleven. So um, anyway. We'll go Jamal. Uh, Jamal works. Yeah, there we go. Yes, <laughs> we'll yeah. Lock that in. Right. That works. Detlef Shrimp also a number. Oh so, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, just a. Uh, I thought that was Ram. So anyway, the the choices for the first in the sixties actually end up being Greg Kite and Carlos Clark of the nineteen eighty four Celtics. So it took quite a while for uh, getting into nineteen eighty four. This point for the um, to, to find our list, but yes. Um, yeah, and, and Greg Kite is really interesting because um, he is has one of the longest careers for someone who has relatively low production in that career. Yeah, it is. It's you know, it really. I get Chris Dudley vibes from him. I get right. the there's a lot of guys. We've talked about this before. We've talked about it mostly yeah. in our Christmas episodes, our holiday episodes, our fun episodes where we watch yeah. old eighties NBA games and and Rainus comes on and goes, Yeah, there's that guy and, and we're all like yeah. laughing at this like schlubby seven foot white guy. We're like, Why is he on this team? Well, it really pays to be six eleven and white in the eighties and early nineties because yeah, Greg Kite, twelve year NBA career, averages of two point five points per game and three point eight rebounds per game. I mean, come on. <laughs> like what are we yeah. doing here? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, yeah, he played over 10,000 minutes and I, you know, I think we did some research, but I don't know if we ever actually did the show. We never, yeah, the, we never fully did the show, but that is, that is coming hopefully yeah. sometime in the, in, All right, in the well, future. Well, that'll so. inspire us to do the show, but yeah, we, we were looking into guys who were like least productive, you know, for, uh, I think the 10,000 minutes frame. And I think Kite was number one on our list. And I will say, yeah, I mean, I, I think that Craig Kite probably is a better player than is reflected in those numbers. You know, he probably did things that I, you know, because you, you just don't stick around in the NBA. Like NBA teams aren't that stupid, even in right, the eighties right, and nineties, right, right. to, to put you know guys who are completely bad on the floor. So, you know, I, he was giving you something, but um, but yeah, I'm sure it probably didn't hurt that you know he was big and white in uh, during that time, but especially yes, for uh, those, those Celtics teams, which were right. uh, oh, yeah. pretty, uh, yeah. pretty yeah. pretty white. Uh, anyway. the, white guys, yeah, <laughs> they were yeah. certainly white. Yes, uh, but no, two time NBA champion with the. Boston Celtics had a semi-famous game though, 87 finals uh, against the Lakers. It's game three uh, NBA finals. As I said, Robert Parrish is in foul trouble. Bill Walton is hurt. Surprise, surprise. Uh, Kite is matched up with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kite had zero points, nine rebounds, two assists, one block and five fouls in his 22 minutes of play, uh, helping the Celtics win uh, uh, to get to a uh, 109-103 victory. Pat Riley after the game says, Kite didn't score a point. It looked like he had a hundred. He had zero. I mean, like, come on, what are we doing here? <laughs> it's not like he had 12. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah. wow, he had 12 points in 22 minutes. That's pretty impressive. Right. He had zero. He had no points. Yeah. I um, mean, yeah, he definitely held, he held Kareem to 27 points, um, <laughs> you know, on, uh, 
you know, uh, 16 shots. So, yeah, but uh, yeah. and then Larry Bird after the game says, I've seen Greg play real well at times. He's got limited offensive ability, but he has a banger and he's probably our hardest worker. He kept Kareem off balance and got a lot of rebounds. His work ethic finally paid off. He stayed with his game and did a really good job. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, I'm sure sure it was, you know, he had to be there. So Yeah. Uh, bounce around a bit his last uh, part of his career, Clippers, Hornets, Kings, before latching on with the upstart Orlando Magic. Uh, he played back up to Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, played his final year in 1995, including two games with the Knicks uh, and nine games with Indiana before officially calling it quits. So, Yes. Uh, yeah, the other player, uh, Carlos Clark, uh, only Two years in the NBA, uh, averaged 2.4 points per game in just 93 games. Um, I, he uh, yeah, he got his ring though. Um, you know, he's African American, so he was he didn't uh, get to have a uh, you know a ten year career like uh, Greg Kite. But, <laughs> he didn't get a lot of snap um, as quotes from Larry Bird yeah, or, or yeah. Pat Riley, but that's all right. right. No, yeah, um, but yes, so he. Um, you know, afterward, he uh, would uh, play in uh, uh, for a whole lot of different uh, leagues, uh, the CBA, the WBL, uh, which is the World Basketball League, um, which I have not even heard of. But uh, yeah, this league. is like all, one of the uh, first few times I've ever heard of the World Basketball League. So yes, I mean. it was also it was at some point it was the International Basketball Association as well. Uh, he played in, in, in Philippines and actually played in um, in Belgium where they uh, he was a key member of the Bobcat Gents when they won the Belgium. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. doesn't remember the Bobcat against. <laughs> so he's listed under teams uh, the Evansville Thunder, the Tampa Bay Flash, the Lacrosse Catbirds, uh, Tampa Bay Stars as well, and the Calgary 88s. So there you go. some great names there, right there. So, um, yes. So, and worth noting that, uh, you know, Magic Johnson, born in 1959, I believe in August, so just misses the cutoff for the, uh, the 1980 Lakers. So. Fun times? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so going to the 1970s, another one where you have to uh, explore a little bit. So Corey Williams played for the 1993 Bulls but was not in the playoffs, so we're not going to count him. Um, but I'm trying to recall if he was actually on the roster during the um, – in 93 or if he had I think he was g- gone from the roster by then so he, he, he had been cut from the team so he wasn't even on the um, team in 93 by the time um, yes he was waived oh no I, I take that back he was actually on the roster but he was waived by the Bulls in 93 so you, you could you could kind of count him but we're not going to do that um, if he didn't play in the playoffs Jojo England also played six games during that season before being waived um and yes, uh, it, Richie, you you were uh, of course a Bulls fan of this era, and you you, you note <laughs> here can't tell us a single thing about Corey Williams. I got nothing. Yeah, I know that uh, I, I I had a I actually looked back. I was I was looking at pictures of him. And I, I remember I have a card of uh, Corey Williams at. Uh, at, you know, at my parents' house or whatever, and it's pretty funny because so the back of the card shows his college stats and it says NBA stats, and they're just blank. And it's just like, well, yeah. you know, and it wasn't like a rookie card; it was like you know, a year or two into this career. But uh, right. anyway, uh, yeah, I can't tell you much. He played just thirty-five games for the Champion Bulls. He averaged two point three uh, points per game. Uh, ended his career the following season after just four games uh, with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And uh, interesting though, he was selected by the Kansas City Chiefs in the twelfth round of the nineteen ninety two NFL Draft, uh, despite the fact that he had not played football since junior high. I'm not entirely sure why though, because you know he was six two one ninety. I mean, he looked like a athlete, but I don't know if I'm like, yeah, let's get this guy. <laughs> That's never like right. I get like some guys. I get it's like, hey, look, that dude, like. You know, he's he's a, he's a big body. Like maybe he'll come to that, but I don't really understand why you draft Corey Williams, the guy who hadn't played football and did anything. But whatever they did, so uh, good for him. Back. Yeah, yeah. Right. good for him. Yeah. He, he was also the coach at Stetson University from uh, 2014 to 2019. Uh, his record: a sterling uh, 58 and 133, though. So ah, that's, that's he's right. no longer in that job. <laughs> so well. Unfortunately, I'm sure Corey Williams is up to to big and beautiful things. Um, but uh, yes, so we will. Um, who, who does count are uh, Robert or, and I, I guess under the, um, you know, the Taylor Tucker Williams um, corollary, Corey Williams would count our list, but we're, we'll do, we're going to go with um, Robert Ori and Chris Gents playing in the playoffs for the 1994 Rockets. Do you, you want to take a big shot, Bob, and I'll take Chris Gent? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Big shot, Bob here. 11th overall pick by the Houston Rockets. Uh, spent his first four season with Houston. Uh, helped them win the NBA championship in 94 and 95. Uh, set some pretty big records at, at the time, too. He set an NBA finals record with seven steals in a game. Uh, also hit five threes in an NBA final 
Cardinals game as well, which, I mean, again, like five threes in, in, in the time period that we're talking about is a pretty big thing. And yeah, that record stood for, for a little while, too. Uh, he was traded. Uh, he was to be traded, I should say, here in February of 1994 to the Detroit Pistons uh, for Sean Elliott. But Elliott failed his physical, so that did not happen. That's an interesting timeline there. Sean Elliott on the on, on those 94-95 Rockets is, is sounds really cool to me. Uh, but I do wonder, like, they probably don't get, you know, they probably don't get Clyde Drexler than that next year, right? Like if if Elliot hangs around and and he's there, and oh right, yeah. yeah. Like they probably right. don't need Clyde, so sure, probably not. That's a good point. It changes, yeah. It changes the whole you know trajectory of that team because then they, I, I don't think they maybe go as old as quickly as they did because like then it was like, hey, we got like a few more years of this course, let's go, and then that leads to you know the Barkley thing and all that sort of stuff and the Pippen thing. Yeah, it's a whole different timeline there of Sean Elliott's uh, on those Rockets and, and and likes it and stays. Uh, but regardless, or he did get traded in 1996. Uh, he was traded to Phoenix in, in part for uh, the aforementioned Charles Barkley. Uh, uh, did not last long, though. He wasn't great, and he threw a towel at Danny Ames, so that didn't go well. Uh, that accelerated his move then to the Lakers, and as we were talking about earlier, I'd moved to the Lakers. He'd win three titles with the Lakers, had a lot more big shots. There's a whole Wikipedia entry uh, of big shots. I would say his, his most famous, uh, the game winner over the uh, Sacramento Kings, Game 6 of the t- uh, 2002 uh, Western Conference Finals. Uh, and then, as we said, played the last five years of his career with San Antonio. He'd win two more rings. Uh, he'd hip check Steve Nash into the scores table and hit a few more shots as well. So that is Robert Ory. Yes. So, so Chris Gent uh, played for Ohio State, was one of my favorite um, you know players at the time. I was a big Ohio State college fan in the early 90s, you know, with, with Jim Jackson and uh, you know, Perry Carter and all those guys. Um, and yes, he ended up. He was undrafted, um, and actually it was only a fourth round pick in the uh, CBA draft. But he, uh, in '94, uh, actually played three regular season games for the '94 Rockets, but then played eleven postseason games, including games in the uh, finals. So um, uh, you know, in in very very small stints, um, you know, just uh, you, you know, four minutes here, seven minutes there, two minutes there. So. Um, Although it was not nearly as uh, – we don't have the plus-minus information here, so we, we can't uh, say for sure what um, exactly his impact on the court was. But uh, it seemed like they did okay. And, um, and hey, his team won, so so we'll give him that. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, yeah, then he was out of the NBA for a while and then had a very brief stint in 97 um, as a player as well with the Knicks. Um but then, yeah, he's basically just been, um, you know, assistant coaching uh, since then, both in um, college and in the uh, pros. He had a stint with the Sixers, with the Magic, was actually the interim coach for the Magic for a bit, the Cavs, the Kings, um, and the Hawks, and then a couple stints as an assistant at um, Ohio State. So, but yeah, he was a real fun, I mean, just like total, like hustle, like run the court, like do crazy stuff yeah. type things. Uh, like he, he was a fun guy to uh, watch and to um, root for, for sure. Yeah. Anytime you watch him, I mean, he's, he's a guy that like, you look at his numbers and you're like, wow, that guy had like no significance, but anybody that has ever you know seen him or watched him play, he stuck out to you. I mean, I, I know definitively, you know, watching him in, in, in some of those, you know, um, any game that I've seen where he jumps into the right. NBA, which again, is very rare that you see a game right. where he's in there, but you see highlights. And he's just, yeah, he's just like all fucking hustle and he's bouncing all over the place. He's doing it. Yeah, he's a, he's a really, really cool player to watch. It's just, yeah, physically, he probably just couldn't hang in the NBA uh, all that well. But it was obviously, a, you know, right. a I smart mean, player. And, and yeah, the coaching, you know, 10 year afterwards, you know, speaks to that for sure. Yeah. I mean, he literally played six games in the NBA for his entire six regular season games in the NBA for his entire career and then played in 11 playoff games. Right. So, which, yeah, <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. Uh, which is probably, I mean, I, I can. I wonder if there, there can't be anybody else who has played more playoff games for their entire career than um, regular season games. Right, that, which that, is the problem. Like you watch, you know, Hardwood Classics or NBA TV or whatever. Right. We watch old games on YouTube and like you see him on the court a lot and you think, wow, this is a significant player. Like, look at him. He's yeah. he's on the court in like these big time playoff games. Then you look at his regular season. You're like, wait, they didn't play in the regular season? I, Only like in the NBA finals? And it's like, yeah, that's that's kind of where it went with him. So right. uh, just I, the guy I mean, that, you know, you could put in and, and, and know that he wasn't going to you know royally, you know, mess anything up and, and, and would give you right. good minutes. So. Although I, I will say the his advanced playoff statistics did, did not indicate uh, that gr- perhaps greatness was in order. So eleven games, sixty two minutes, four point five per three three twenty five shooting percentage. Not great. Um, yes, uh, and then uh, box plus, box score plus minus of negative four point eight. So yeah, not um, not good indication. He did it in yeah, the things yeah. that don't make the box score. 
Jason. All right. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> like <laughs> running fast down the court. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, hey, I mean, I mean, he was really fun to watch Ohio State. Yeah. I will, oh, for sure. How good he was. Uh, no, he's is, like a very yeah, famous college player. Up in player, the air. But, sure. but he was yeah. he was really fun to watch play. So. Uh, all right. So we're going to buzz through these last few because they're they're more familiar names. Uh, first in the 1980s uh, was Tony Parker in 2003. I think you all know pretty much everything about Tony Parker, so we don't need to um, really talk about him. Uh, and then the first players in the 1990s to win rings were both with the 2014 Spurs, Kawhi Leonard and Corey Joseph. Um, again, Kawhi Leonard, I think you guys are super familiar with. Corey Joseph might have might be able to give you convey some information about Corey Joseph that you may not know. Yeah, let, let's let's do that. So yeah, Kawhi, like, come on, he's he's still playing, and you know Kawhi and, and Tony Parker. Come on, you know Tony Parker. So Corey Joseph, though, uh, born in Toronto, uh, he came up as one of the uh, elite players in Canada as a youth. Uh, he he uh, and fellow future NBA player Kelly Olynyk were part of the Scarborough Blues uh, AU team that rarely lost. This team didn't. This was like the top AU team. They rarely lost in the late nineties and early two thousands. One defeat though came against rival Toronto Five O, led by one and only. Steph Curry, who was playing there wow. because uh, Del Curry was obviously playing for the Raptors at that time. Uh, so yeah. Steph Curry plays you know, Toronto AAU ball and defeats the the dreaded Scarborough Blues uh, AAU team. So there you go. Uh, 29th overall pick by the San Antonio Spurs in 2011. Uh, did not make a real big impact on the NBA's first few years. Bounce between the Spurs and the Austin Toros of the D-League slash G-League. I think it was still the D-League at that point. Uh, in 2013, starting point guard for the Spurs as they matched, uh, marched towards the uh, 2013 finals, though. Uh, Parker was in Injured, kind of not his full self, and Joseph answered the call. Uh, he, he played pretty well. They ended up, of course, losing in, in, in seven games, uh, but from that point forward, Joseph at least staked a little bit of a claim uh, in the NBA. Uh, 2014, he was a member of the Spurs championship team, but obviously Parker was back and, and, and relatively healthy, so uh, he wasn't a, a key piece there, but he was an important part. Uh, then 2015, he signs with his hometown Toronto Raptors as a key piece uh, to their climb back to respectability, or so they thought. Uh, he ended up averaging a career-high 9.3 points per game in 2017, but did really didn't live up to the high expectations or the contract that they had for him. Yeah, you know, the emerging, uh, the emergence of like Fred Van Vliet and guys like that really, uh, uh, you know, made Joseph kind of expendable. Uh, and then he was traded to Indiana for the draft rights to something called Emir Predzlik, something like that. It doesn't matter. Yep, uh, sure. played one year. Yeah, I don't think he's yeah. in the NBA and I don't think he's going to be in the NBA. So I don't think we have to worry about him just yet. Uh, we're going to sound like idiots in five years when he's like, you know, <laughs> an incredible yeah. player or something. You know? player, yeah. yeah, he's right. like a Eurostash and six years later. He's like 17 when they did this and now he's going to come and be great or something. So <laughs> yep. everyone's exactly. going to be like, hey, remember what those guys said? Emir was yeah. crappy we're, or something? We'll get the, we'll get the hot, the bad sports takes. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, the ice cold, the ice cold takes. Yeah, Like, look at these yeah. idiots. All right. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, played one year with Indiana, then signed with the Sacramento Kings for the 2019-20 uh, season. And we'll see yes. uh, what's leads to the future of Corey Joseph. Yes, I, I need to correct the record. Two years with Indiana. And oh, that's right. Sorry, sorry. To, sorry. The, uh, to the Kings. So, um, yes. So, uh, yeah, I would not have been able to tell you that Corey Joseph was still in the uh, league. So I, didn't <laughs> I really did Well, when you go to the uh, Sacramento Kings, are you really? I mean. I, I didn't watch a lot of Kings, I, I must admit, this year. This year. So, um, apologies to Kings fans and to um, Corey Joseph for okay. my uh, – Lack of observation. So. I think we're safe with Amir. He's already 33 years old. So okay. <laughs> I think we're okay. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess probably if he'd have, if he'd have made if his it time. If it hasn't happened you know. yet, I don't think it's going to happen right now. He averaged, yeah, uh, yeah no, I I, I him, think we're yeah. good. I think we're safe. But we'll, Him we'll and Baby Shaq, you know, they're going to, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think uh, yeah, we did. We it. got through it. Yeah. So this was fun. This was uh, you know, dig a little, little history. We um, I think we meant to get this one out a little earlier, a little closer to the actual end of the finals. But you know, in like two three years, no one's gonna know the difference anyway. So, um, I think we're good. But we appreciate everybody uh, who is listening and enjoying the show. If you uh, want to uh, give us a rating and review on uh, the podcast uh, platform of your choice that would be great we would appreciate that we are of course on apple podcasts and pretty much any uh any service if we're not on there and you want us to be on there let us know and we will uh, get added uh, to it if we can you can uh, communicate to us via twitter or facebook at uh, over and back nba on either platform and um that's about it um uh, thanks everyone for listening and we'll be back again soon 